things that's helped me through the recent political years. So I would say I, I had the limits. My talk to 50 minutes, and I'm going to try. Uh, right, Gerardo? Yes. Uh, we have a problem of loss of biodiversity, of the wild disappearing, which is far beyond the imagination of 99% of people in the United States because they're not told about it. Think about it. In the last 30 or 40 years, as it was just published in Science yesterday when the issue got to me, uh, we lost roughly 30% of the birds in North America. In Germany, flying insects went down in roughly the same period by about 70%. Uh, this, the biodiversity of the planet is disappearing at a rate that boggles the minds of every scientist who knows anything about it. Uh, for example, one of the things that was a, a feature of my youth, which wasn't all that long ago, was when you drove in the Midwest or the East, and sometimes in California, so many bugs came into the radiator of your car, I can remember stopping and pulling dozens of butterflies out of the radiator because the car was starting to heat up. Where Gerardo and I and Gretchen Daly and our faculty here have worked in Costa Rica, we used to study the thousands of moths that came into any light that you had. They're gone. Uh, we are losing the other organisms, <coughs> other organisms of the planet. And the issue is, who cares? What you all have to know is that they are the essential parts of our life support systems. Without them, we would not have food, we wouldn't have clean water, we'd have much more disease, uh, we would not have our uh, plants pollinated, on and on and on. If we lose the biodiversity of the planet, we're going to lose us because we're part of it and we're absolutely dependent upon it. Why is it disappearing? The list is long. Uh, some of it's tied into the other existential threats. For instance, climate disruption is one of the things that's wiping out other populations. Toxics. We're circling the planet and all of us, you know, if you looked at your blood carefully analyzed, it would look like the shelf list in a Stanford organic chemistry lab. Uh, all those things are t tied to habitat destruction, the toxics that I've already mentioned, loss of soils, over-intensive agriculture. The bottom line, of course, is there are many too many people, uh, and we consume too much, and we're much too unequal in our consumption. The people in this room are, it's not the poor people in Africa that threaten our life support systems, it's us. We use so much more the product of the number of people and the, the amount they each consume tell you where the problems are, and that's something we should be looking at a, more, a lot more closely, and we are, of course, doing that. Anyway, we're going to be doing something about it. That's what Saving the New Wild is about. Uh, we're going to continue research. We're trying to develop databases that will tell you where everything is now, so we'll know better how fast it's disappearing. Although we know it's disappearing so fast, we don't need that information, really. And we're also trying to establish parks uh, that will be reservoirs from which after the collapse, and everybody knows there's going to be a collapse, if the collapse is not because of a nuclear war, uh, what we can do maybe to ameliorate the collapse and then afterwards to do a restart and try and build a civilization which will not get growth mania and simply do the same thing over again, but faster. It's going to be tough to do it over again. We really need to do a restart. And finally, and I was just discussing this with a colleague uh, in Australia, if you think more research is needed, if you think more writing about this problem is needed, you're not in track with the scientists who know it best. We all think we need to be on the streets. This is a time now to get out there and say what's wrong, announce it, and do it. We're going to talk about Stop Extinction, that is our initiative to try to uh, come out with some solutions uh, to try to uh, avert the massive losses of uh, populations and species. Uh, I was struck by many years ago by when I was reading Andrew Leopold and other great uh, writers 
when he said that we live in a, in a world of wounds. And if you look around, the world is uh, full of wounds, wounds made by us. And those wounds are now threatening our own existence. Uh, my background is a scientist. I do uh, a basic research. I love to do basic research. And I've done a lot of work here at Stanford with my colleagues, Paul Ehrlich, uh, Rodolfo Dirso, and Liz Handley. Uh, uh, but also, since I was very young, I have been uh, urged for some reason to try to put my uh, uh, results into conservation. In my study group, we have been able to put uh, to uh, create 2% uh, of the Mexican land is protected because of our work. We did the first Endangered Species Act and so on. And, uh, but that's not enough. Uh, the biodiversity on Earth, when I started a, a study uh, a biology not many years ago, well, many years ago, <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there were, uh, uh, we thought there were like uh, 10 million species. Now, some people think there are uh, trillions of species for organisms. And in that sense, uh, most of them are unknown. My own study group has found more than 20 new species of uh, mammals in South America and Mexico in the last 10 years, including monkeys, porcupines, and so on. So most of our wealth is unknown. And uh, there is an unprecedented fundamental problem. We're losing uh, too much uh, biodiversity. Uh, we're losing populations, and this is a, a big thing that we have done with uh, Paul Ehrlich, is to call the attention that the extinction crisis is not only about the species, but it's also about populations. We could end up with a ridiculous situation, hypothetical situation, where there was no extinction of any population, of any, of any species, but having only one population. One population of lions, one population of pines, one population of oaks, and we will be in really deep trouble. What it has happened, uh, we have been uh, studying this, and uh, now we are completely uh, certain that uh, uh, we have lost so many species uh, uh, in the last 500 years most of them in the last uh, uh, 100 years, that we have entered the sixth mass extinction. In the last 600 years, 600 million years, there has been five uh, massive extinction, is what we scientists call them, and they are uh, basically catastrophic. They have evaporated from 70 or more of all the species on Earth. They were very fast, hundreds of thousands or ten thousands of years uh, uh, in geological terms. And they were caused by a, a, a natural uh, phenomenon, like the meteorite hitting the, the Earth 65 million years ago. In this particular one, the sixth one, is one caused by us, by humans. And that's by news. But on the other hand, that's good news, because it means that we can solve it. It's like global warming, where people say that it's not human cause. That will be very bad news. If it's human cause, we can do something about it. Our own study has shown that the species last in the, time, uh, uh, in the last 500 years. If you see the dotted line, this will be what we call the normal of a ground extinction. If there were not an uh, uh, increased extinction rate, the, the, the color lines will, will have to be below that dotted line. But you can see it is much higher up. This means that the species, and this is concrete data, that the species that we lost in the last 100 years would have taken up to 10,000 years to be lost on their natural times. Mm -hmm. And it's only a tiny fraction of the species that we have information on. We don't know what is happening with microbes, with most of the insects, with most of the vertebrates. But anyway, what we know is that the species of vertebrates, mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles, that were lost in the last 100 years would have taken up to 10,000 years to be lost in normal times. That's the magnitude of the problem. And we know this is caused, first of all, as Paul has said, and Trevor has said, that population growth, our consumption, our inefficient technologies. Um, this is a fundamental part that we want to work on. We're working together with the global conservation, mm -hmm. is to protect the last habitats. We're losing too much habitat. So we have things like that. This is the pangolins are really beautiful animals. You see them there. And they are uh, covered by scales, like uh, the scales are made like your fingernail. And uh, those animals are being killed because in China and other places in Southeast Asia, they think that they have a uh, powerful, uh, there are powerful drugs for uh, so solving some health problems. And this is a very famous photo, it's called the pangolin pit. The pangolin pit is like 3,000 pangolins that were confiscated. And, um, uh, the lady who took the photograph from the Nat Geo fainted before uh, taking the photo because it was so, so shocking. And Paul Ehrlich and us, we have been in Africa 
literally uh, many times, uh, dozens of times, and we have seen only one in the wild. And recently they cover, they recovered 30 tons of scales. It's probably 70,000 of these animals or more. Where do they find them? I mean, there will be no pangolins in 10 years if we continue. And we know that uh, global warming, global disruption, is coming in full force. And if you put this together on top of the other uh, human activities, it means that uh, we're going to be in a much uh, difficult times in the coming future. So uh, we know that the population extinction is very severe. It's even worse than species extinction. 60% of all the animals, individual animals, all the lions, all the giraffes, all the rhinos, all the uh, tuna fishes, has been lost since 1990, uh, uh, And this is what we're causing. Every 15 minutes, there is an elephant killed illegally. There probably will be no elephants in the wild in 230, 235, if we continue like that. So this is what we're trying to, uh, we're acting, and uh, this is one of these examples, you know. We destroy the mangroves, we put housing, streams, uh, farms, and crops, and then we have a hurricane that destroys these areas. Because the mangroves serve, among their many functions, one is protect us uh, against uh, these uh, uh, natural catastrophes. Anyway, we don't have much time. We really think that we have probably 10, 15 years to uh, change uh, the course of uh, these uh, massive uh, problems. And stop extinction basically is our initiative that will uh, 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 get together with global conservation and uh, probably a stop rebellion and other groups to achieve these three things. First of all, we want a direct engagement with selected governments. We want to force those governments to do what they have to do. And the second thing is to build awareness and understanding of conservation uh, by using this database. We have a database that right now has 30,000 species of vertebrates, and I will show you an example. And this is the kind of database we have. This is a distribution, and this is the first time in the history of humankind that you can visualize in, map, in one, just one map the distribution of all the vertebrates on Earth. This is the distribution of 30,000 species. This kind of things. For instance, this is the amphibia. There are 6,410. How many are in danger? How many are uh, 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 critically in danger? How many are not a uh, problem? What are all those species and so on? So the database, we think, it will become a very powerful uh, a tool that anybody can use in their cell phone, in their uh, 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 computer, whatever. And then these are some of our goals. We want to have 15 to 20 government agreements in the next five years, even more. We want to be more aggressive. Uh, we want to have 10, 100 protected areas like the ones that we have now with global conservation. I say only uh, five or six or 10, but we want to have 100. We want to have the most powerful conservation database to date. There is nothing similar already, but we want to make it really powerful. And finally, we want the science to be the basis for other movements, such as Extinction Rebellion. And I was feeling saying that I was struck when I was very young, my parents bought a book in Mexico City. We live in another city close to Mexico City and gave me that book. I was probably like 14 years old. And it was about this guy who was a, a, a Jan Dors. He published his book in, in, in French. It's called Before Nature Dies in 1968 the same year that Paul Early published The Population Bomb. And he was a visionary at that one, because he, at that time, if you read that book, he talks about extinction, global warming, pollution, and so on, all the big problems in 1968. And at the end, I remember this phrase that really touched my heart and pushed me to try to do something and say, nature, nature will only be safe if man loves it, simply because it's beautiful. For that too, it's an integral part of the human soul. Thank you very much.